For my talk, this third one is the management of dialysis access, stenosis, and occlusion, which again, like every talk here today, could have been an hour by itself instead of 15 minutes. So we're just going to push through. Um, again, acknowledgement to Dr. El Said, who was the 2014 lecture, and we build on other people's lectures in this course, which I think is a great idea uh, for people who are very busy. Uh, I have no disclosures. Definitions of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal failure and hemodialysis are there. You have to know that to be able to move forward with anything with hemodialysis access. Um, and I think it's just a good idea that if you're going to do dialysis access as residents, that you just know these definitions. We certainly have to know them as faculty. You know, there's a huge burden in the United States, and it's growing. It's not getting less. And right now, one out of 10 people have chronic kidney disease, which is about 30 million people in the United States. More than a million are being tested, being treated for end-stage renal disease, and you've got probably now up to a half million on, on hemodialysis access. Um, and the actual cost of that is obvious, and it's, it is getting worse. This is a 2009 uh, uh, estimate uh, in terms of billions of dollars that are spent in the United States, and uh, um, <clears throat> it's going to get worse. Here's a graph showing, again, most of the population with CKD and the adjusted rates of end-stage renal failure um, as they move up to 2009. So what are the issues that we want to talk about today is that as the number of patients on hemodialysis, either fistula or grafts, continues to grow, that the number of actual treatment options and, and how to treat those grafts once they go down or in the prompts, process of going down is going up as well. And we have to have creative strategies to do that. The access stenosis is a growing problem, um, and we have to be able to modify and treat it. So. So some of them can be completely asymptomatic. Some can be severe enough that they'll present with venous hypertension while under dialysis. And some with, can present uh, with clues while they're on the dialysis machine. This, is the, uh, this comes uh, from the National Kidney Foundation in terms of what's actually the guidelines when you're either putting in the access or treating it once it's in. And you can see here that and once you do a PTA and AV graft, it's supposed to stay open for a minimum of four months. Um, and that obviously is not a long time, but that's part of the maintenance program of dialysis access that you'll begin to learn as residents. Um, there are two failure modes, early and late, inflow stenosis, failure to mature. Late is an outflow stenosis, stasis, and thrombosis, and that's in a very general sense. If you think about your fistulas in your graft, you have an arterial anastomosis, you have a juxta anastomotic area, you have ingraft or in fistula, you have a venous juxta anastomosis area, you have a venous anastomosis, and you have central venography. So there are probably five to six areas that are fraught for when stenoses or occlusions can develop, and you have to be able to treat those accordingly. Usually it's intimal hyperplasia at the anastomotic site, typically the venous High flow states, high shear states create excessive areas of turbulence in the veins which result in intimal hyperplasia. Veins are not used to having high flow. It changes their whole mindset if you think that they're alive, right? So they're designed to have low flow, low pressure system, but now it's a high pressure, high flow system. Um, how, how do we treat this? How do we figure that out? Well. There's surveillance, and that could be due to weekly clinical monitoring in your access uh, outpatient. How many of you are going to have an access rotation, or is it just part of your general vascular system? Who actually has a month-long access rotation in their residency or fellowship? Allison, anyone else? So that's surprising. How about you guys? Uh, we just do a lot of it. Yeah. We, well, in fellowship, actually, we just did it year-round. Yeah. But, you know, I found many of my colleagues never did any access. Right. And so, and then when you get into practice, that's a lot of what you do, right? I mean, look at the numbers of who's on dialysis and they all, they're all they all funded, they're all Medicare, um, and people are just lost when they start because, right. I mean, you don't even know how to work them up. So one, one of the goals that I'm, I'm interested in is developing sort of teaching programs for that. There is a wide variety of experience in dialysis access, and like the majority of people get a couple here and there. How many, who's PGY 7s here? Anyone? Or a 5? No, you guys are all young. Okay. So again, we can't really talk about it because you haven't gone through your fellowship. But it's a, a great variability in terms of your experience. 
I personally believe that dialysis access should be a month-long rotation. That's all you do to get you ready to graduate and probably should happen during your second year or twice when first year and second year or your fourth and fifth years as your senior vascular because you're going to, that pays the bills. It does pay the, the bills. The majority of... <laughs> The majority, the majority of your income is going to not come from inpatient peripheral vascular cases where they're in the hospital for 10 days or whatever, complicated cases. It's going to be the outpatient dialysis access. So anyway, the other way to survey it is clinical monitoring, pulsatility, loss of the thrill, prolonged bleeding at dialysis, periodic surveillance. You can use duplex to check flows, stenosis to check, but velocities at the anastomoses are really inconsistent. <clears throat> It typically works best in an ingraft or in a, an in fistula with parallel walls, because then you can assess adjacent, um, adjacent stenoses. You look at dynamic and static pressures during dialysis, the venous pressures, and you look at calculation of recirculation. All sorts of ways to do it. Two randomized trials looked at whether or not we should intervene before anything happens based on clinical assessment or hemodynamic uh, results or just wait for them to present clinically, not with a thrombos graft, but with some of the things we talked about. And they found that there was no difference or improvement in the fistula patency rate or the number of thromboses to the grafts or fistulas. So it made no sense to be preemptive, to be prophylactic, to do a 60% 60 60 asymptomatic carotid stenosis, right, because it's prophylactic, right, to prevent a stroke. So that's I use that as a, as a comparison. We don't treat dialysis grafts prophylactically. There's no benefit. Um, so what to treat? Well, we treat all people who have significant stenoses that present clinically, not just the stenosis. And we, I, at least my practice, we only treat the symptomatic patients based on what we find clinically and in dialysis. Again, preemptive treatment doesn't work. Observation is better. So what are your findings? When you're in the, if you're on a service, increased pulsatility, pulsatile AVF and AVG, dilated veins around the chest signify a central stenosis or obstruction. If your pseudoaneurysm is getting larger, that means they've got an outflow obstruction. If they develop a new pseudoaneurysm, either in the fistula or the graft, it means they've got a central obstruction. Progressive arm edema, central obstruction. Excessive face and neck swelling, central obstruction. Is there a theme here? Right, and prolonged bleeding from puncture sites, central obstruction. It tends to be the majority of the issues that we find. These are some of the indications, hemodynamic findings in the literature. Uh, I won't belabor them because I'm running a little bit short of time. Uh, the idea is that you like blood flow rates uh, at dialysis probably 300 to 500, but your actually fistula flow should be 2 to 20 to 30 percent higher than that in order to accommodate the flow during dialysis so the vein doesn't collapse. So your actual fistula flow, graft flow, should be somewhere between 700 to 1,000 milliliters per minute, while your dialysis flows can range between 300 to 500, depending on how fast and how long they're going to run them. So the majority of the stenoses occur at the venous end, and this is just a table of the frequency. So our options are no different than arterial, PTA, PTA with bare metal stent, PTA and covered stent or using a cutting balloon in case of a hard to use, um, hard to treat stenosis, or using a buddy wire, buddy wire as a cutting balloon type of, of, of procedure. So what about PTA versus primary stenting? There's no advantage to stenting outflow stenosis with bare metal stents primarily. Your job is to maintain the fistula. The minute you put a stent in, the clock is running even faster than after you balloon angioplasty a fistula. My guess is that if you put a stent in, you're going to be coming back for a revision surgically probably within 6 to 12 months. And you're going to have to go higher up if you have an ABG or an AB fistula, or you're going to have to abandon that fistula and try something new. So I try personally to avoid stenting at all costs um, if possible. There are indications for it, but they're not common. Dr. Mattis, when do you decide to use cutting balloons and what what are your what has been your experience about it? Because I've used it twice, and then the graphs thrombos. Right. So, so uh, the, the the idea about using a cutting balloon is a great question, Linda. Is that that the lesion that you're dilating with a high pressure balloon? Because there's high pressure and there's regular pressure balloons. Is that you're not cracking plaque, right? You're cracking fibrosis. You're cracking needle stick. Um, 
you know, stuff that's related to the needle stick in the graph or the fistula. The idea about the cutting balloon is that you're actually making four marks into, the, into that fibrotic area that then you then dilate open and it maintains dilatation. I find that the lesions in the dialysis graft don't respond good to cutting balloons. I hardly ever, ever use it. My job and our job is to let you know that these are options, but I'm like you, I have not had yeah, great success. No. It, it looks great when you're in there, yeah. and then like the next day, the things, is, yeah. is that it? No. No, I, I think when you have the problem with grafts you, and with a <coughs> grass official is that you want a relatively smooth lumen as much as possible. You know, in arterial disease, you crack the plaque. You create a longitudinal dissection. You get collagen exposure. You get reformation of that lumen. That's not the case in fistulas or grafts. It's different. And so I don't think the same thing. Cutting balloons don't work as well. Um, so I try to avoid it. Some of my partners use it, and I just sort of shake my head and say, okay, you go ahead and use it. Um, I'm not going to take care. You're going to take care of that patient because he's going to come back when it's your time to be in the dialysis center. Um, so stenting only when you get suboptimal results from angioplasty. And there's no fixed number. We tend to actually, um, we'll treat people every three months for as long as they have a graft. We do sort of this maintenance program because they typically come back with prolonged bleeding, high venous pressures, or they come back with a loss of a thrill, deep, de decreased brewery, decreased thrill, or they come with arm edema. So we know, based on that, compared to their previous exam, that it's time for a checkup. And that's the way to keep it open. Maintenance is going to be the key after you place the graft. You can side branch coil on the side branch, or you can do open uh, to try and avoid excess flow out of the fistula and maintain better flow. So this patient had low flow during dialysis, and you can see that he had a venous anastomosis problem here. And so we did a balloon and opened it up quite nicely. Now, ideally, you think, boy, that's going to last for a year. No, that'll come back in three months. So our typical practice is that they come back in a month after we dilate them in our outpatient center. We tell them, like Linda said, and, and tell is that, nope, this is not forever. It's coming back. Just plan on it. We'll make your pain, we'll make your trip to our dialysis center as easy as possible. And so every three months we treat. Here's a more cephalic turn down stenosis. Typically we go up when we do our measurements and it's typically a seven millimeter, eight millimeter balloon into the fistula in the arm and it gets to be larger 10, 12, 14 as you go more centrally. Again, these are just more examples. You see wasting in the top right. Uh, and again, I look at that and it's not great uh, in that axillary vein. You can see the graft coming on the underneath part. And so I'm a little suspect that I'll be back in a month or two to treat that. Now the question is what I put a stent in there. If I put a stent in there, I've now taken away this area to do a surgical extension if I need to. If the stent comes to here, I'll probably have to go to the subclavian now. I'm not sure I really want to do that, particularly in some of the heavier places. If you have somebody skinny, you can get to that area pretty easily, but if I have somebody who's heavy, that's not going to work. So I I'm tend to not stent very much there unless it's so badly diseased um, and then it's just failing every single angioplasty within a month. We tend to be a little bit aggressive with stenting at that point. Um, centrally, you're going to go with larger balloons in the subclavian and nominate vein. And some of the difficulty that you have is that they're almost the stenosis is always at the junction. And so it's always a little bit hard to keep the balloon there because the balloon wants to straighten out and wants to perforate the nominate vein there. So you have to be careful. Either pushes down or comes up. We tend to go with the balloon up slowly. It's not an arterial lesion. You don't go up fast and crack it. It's a slow opening of the balloon. We go for prolonged durations of two minutes or more. We check how much pain they're having because we do it with no anesthesia. We only barely give uh, fentanyl or Versed if they actually need it. We give 1% lidocaine to access and that's it. So it's actually pretty much drug free, but you have to go up slowly and come down slowly. Prolonged inflations. Here's an example of large collaterals, ballooned up the innominate. You can see that the collaterals are gone, ballooned up the innominate again. So by the time you're done, there are no collaterals. So presence of collaterals is an indication you have a more proximal obstruction. Loss of collaterals after treatment is usually successful. Here's an innominate vein occlusion, and you have to work very hard to get through that and try and open that back up, because typically that might be the only uh, place that they have 
um, the ability to dialyze through. You can't quit on these people because the other option is they go to the groin. And the groin's a nasty place for many people. If you're thin and you have a good leg and you don't have a paniculus that rubs on the incision or the area of the, where they're sticking, great. But that's really not the case. Michigan has got, there's, there's things called Michigan units that are probably on par with Louisiana and Texas units, and there's a lot of them. So uh, it's, you have to be careful about that. So if you've got a central venous obstruction or an occlusion, you can use the hero graft. And Linda went through that, so there's no reason for me to belabor it, but it's used to salvage an occlusion centrally. It works pretty well, although we just looked up our last 50 patients. We're going to try and present it that most two-thirds were dead in six months, which means that it's an end-stage procedure for us. I don't know how it is for you guys. Uh, but for all of us, I was quite surprised because the data suggests, like John uh, Ross from South Carolina, he's a general surgeon, he's huge numbers of... Um, uh, huge numbers of, uh, of dial. He had like put in 350 and he had this one or two year patency uh, and survival and I'm thinking he's putting in in the wrong people. Well, our people are end stage, end stage, last last chance. And so I thought that was interesting. This is just uh, shows the pictures of it. I got to move because I'm late, sorry. Venous anastomosis, stenosis. Sometimes after repeated PTAs, you do have to stent. If you can stent without progressively moving the stent too far proximal, then sometimes that's okay. Bare metal stent versus covered is better because you don't lose your collaterals. Again, I'm just going to go through this really fast. Sometimes on the femoral loop, you get a stenosis. You got to balloon the external iliac and or stent that. Now, I'd be more likely to stent an iliac vein in a loop ABG in the thigh because that's not really an area I need to get to via surgery. Covered stents, there they are for you. You can get an erosion. You can put a stent, cover stent in there to stop the erosion temporarily. Yeah, make sure that it's not exposed, otherwise it'll get infected. You get a femoral pseudoaneurysm and put a cover stent. Again, I'm not, we got to get it moving because I get it to the other guys. But anyway, you can use covered stents selectively. Here's thrombus remaining in a pseudoaneurysm. That's not okay. Put the covered stent in. Techniques for thrombose ABG, there's all sorts of techniques. Cleaners, macerators, compressors, sweepers, dissolvers, pulsers, and scrubbers. And there's all sorts of different ways to do that. Your attendings will have different ways to do it. I scrub, and I won't get into the technique. Other people, Angio Jet, what do you do for occluded grafts? Uh, open. You do it open. But I, only because percutaneous at Methodist is a bit difficult to do, but I've trained in doing mostly perk. But yeah. now I do open. Yeah, so I, we don't hardly do any open unless we have to do it in the hospital because we, we can get it done reasonably well but everybody will have a different style you go back home I guarantee you all of your faculty will do it differently so again I, I gotta get going because it's the next person but the technique for simple declots is there total access thrombosis is a problem it requires a little more work because you have to declot the central venous system which may cause may require thrombolysis and an angiojet um, and again Total access thrombosis is much more uh, severe and has a decreased patency compared to simple graft or fistula thrombosis. Open surgical invention, in my mind, for failure response endovascular, um, and you have to be careful about that. And here's some other options for that. And thank you very much. Uh, I, oh, I want to mention one thing. So your job when you graduate is a five-part program. You create, you maintain, you revise, you terminate, and you move. Those are the five parts of dialysis. Create it, maintain it with balloons, revise it as necessary, <coughs> terminate it, and move to another part of the body. You've got to have that mindset because these people, once you treat them, they're yours forever until they die. They're not going away. It's not a gallbladder that never comes back. They are yours forever, all right? So take good care of them. Thank you.